I'm Jeff. And I'm Steve. We're out here looking for something that's been buried for thousands of years. We can't tell you where we are, but we can tell you that we're the meteorite men. Blazing across the night sky, they arrive without warning. Visitors from other worlds who've traveled millions of miles and now lie buried, waiting to be discovered. Steve Arnold and Jeff Notkin are driven by a single obsession to unearth these alien visitors. Look at that. They are meteorite hunters. Oh! What could be more mysterious and exciting than looking for lost bits of the universe that have landed on Earth? Oh! <laughs> it's a monster. Their quest takes them around the world, searching for rocks from deep space that hold answers to our biggest questions. They are the oldest record of the very beginnings of our solar system. Their mission is part science. This might have seeded life on our planet. Woo! Part treasure hunting. A lot of meteorites are worth more than gold. Complete with ancient maps, <laughs> secret sites, and something never seen before. These meteorites are packed with gemstones from outer space. You're wearing a part of creation around your neck when you're wearing this, because this is the interior of a planet. <laughs> wow! It's just another day's adventure for the meteorite men. This is looking quite big. <laughs> Steve Arnold and Jeff Notkin are modern-day treasure hunters. Their typical morning begins like most of ours, with a commute. But today, their commute will take them deep into the heartland of America on a quest for the ultimate buried treasure, meteorites that date back to the origins of our solar system. I became a meteorite hunter by accident. I was actually doing some research on how to do treasure hunting. And I ran across a newspaper story from 1890 where this lady had found a meteorite and had sold it to the uh, chancellor of the University of Kansas. And I went, wow, meteorites were worth money over 100 years ago. I wonder if they're worth money today. Steve poured through public records and found old maps of meteorite finds. All of a sudden, I had these maps. And they were like real treasure maps. First one. The clues on those maps led Steve to some major meteorite discoveries that were soon in demand with collectors and scientists. <laughs> Woo! Then in 2005, while searching in a wheat field in the middle of Kansas, Steve unearthed a record setting 1,430 pounder. The media dubbed it the million dollar rock. It was like, oh my God, this is the day my life has just changed. Steve's meteorite hunting partner is Jeff Notkin. Jeff got hooked on outer space as a child in London. I got permission from my parents to skip school and stay home and watch the Apollo moon landings on television. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I was probably six or seven, and my mother took me to the Geological Museum in London. There's this dark, moody, ominous room, and it's full of meteorites. I was just stunned. I mean, these things were actually from out there. These weren't rocks from Earth. These were visitors from space, and they let me put my hands on these meteorites, and it was chilling. And from that moment on, I was bitten, and I never recovered from that bite. Steve and Jeff met in 1997 on a meteorite hunting expedition in Chile. They've been hunting as a team ever since. Although they've traveled the world together and share the same birthday, the similarities end there. I grew up a football star in Kansas, and he's a punk rock star in, in London. Steve's conservative. He is very liberal. Jeff's a neat freak. Some would say I'm sloppy. I am a vegetarian. And I'm a strict carnivore. The thing we have in common is we love getting out into the wild places and digging for space rocks. Today, Jeff and Steve are heading for Brenham, Kansas, where several thousand years ago, a large meteorite had the same destination. Their goal is to find remnants of that ancient rock. 
Well, look at what the wind blew in. How are you doing? It was a tornado, actually. Yeah. I saw Dorothy on my way in. She and, was, and Toto? She, I didn't see the dog. Oh. She was standing Pieces of the Brenham meteorite have been unearthed in these fields for more than a century. It was thought that everything had been recovered. That is, until Steve found his record-setting rock here. Everyone thought there can't possibly be any more meteorites there because people have been hunting since the 1880s. There probably isn't even a pea-sized piece left. That's what everyone thought except Steve. He just rocked the meteorite world, the biggest Brenham ever found. Inspired by the big find, Steve and Jeff believe that some of the largest pieces of the meteorite are still deep underground, beyond the scope of traditional detection equipment. I'm ready to find some rocks. All right, let's go, let's go. I want to see. So they've come with an arsenal of tools. I saw. Because most meteorites have a high iron content, metal detectors are essential. Steve and Jeff bring several. This is one of my favorite metal detectors. It doesn't have a very big range, but it's really good for finding smaller targets or for pinpointing larger targets when you're close to them. All metal detectors work on the same basic principle. A signal is sent through a coil and broadcast into the ground as an electromagnetic field. Encountering metallic objects alters that field, and that change in frequency is heard on a speaker. There's our signal. That little beep tells us we found a metallic object. Unfortunately, by the time I get up to here, a couple of feet away, can't see the target anymore. This detector, you'll notice the coil is really big. And this allows us to go even deeper. But for meteorites even deeper underground, you need a detector with an even bigger coil. This is what we call the one meter coil. It may look completely different from the other detectors, but basically it's the same thing. Here's the control box sends a signal down this wire, and here's the coil that sends our electromagnetic pulse down into the ground looking for targets. This piece of equipment will find a meteorite five, six, seven, eight feet underground if it's a large target. We love it. But Steve and Jeff need to think even bigger, so Steve designed the ultimate meteorite hunting weapon. This is probably kind of how the Wright brothers assembled their uh, first airplane. OK, let's lift this over. You don't go to your favorite mega store and go to the meteorite hunting aisle and, and find the stuff you need to hunt. How do these things get so tangled up on their own? To search large areas, Steve envisioned a giant metal detector that could be pulled by a truck or an ATV. If you want to find the big stuff, you got to go big. His solution was a sled made of PVC pipe, big enough to carry a metal detecting coil 50 feet long. Oh, yeah, don't forget the flag. Can we put a small English flag up there as well? Because there can't be any metal near the coil, plastic zip ties and duct tape are used to fasten it to the sled. Over the back. Fully assembled, the detector measures 126 square feet and can detect meteorites 10 to 20 feet deep. Oh, I feel like uh, Charlton Heston and Ben Hur. In the old days, hunters would walk a field like this using the little handheld detectors. It's hundreds of acres. You could spend your whole life doing it. With this unit that Steve designed himself, we can cover a huge area like this in a couple of days. But even with the best equipment, knowing where to search for the hidden rocks comes down to understanding just how the meteorite first made its entry into our atmosphere. Now, when an asteroid comes into the Earth's atmosphere, it, it usually will break up. The, the, the force on the masses is, is tremendous. It breaks up into multiple pieces. So the rock will come in, and as it comes in, the, the smaller pieces start to drop off, but the larger pieces with more inertia will go further. The landing zone is called a strewn field because the meteorites are literally strewn along a path by the disintegrating meteor. At Brenham, that path spreads out over nine square miles. In this particular place, we have 125 years of documented meteorite recoveries. And so what we do is go back into the old records and find out where, where other pieces have been found. So we put all that intelligence together into a map. The yellow is the approximate boundary of the strewn field, and the red stars are some of the meteorites that have been found. The biggest star right here is the largest Brennan meteorite, which was found by Steve a couple of years ago in that field just over there. So we're really close. Their hunch is that other massive pieces followed the same trajectory as Steve's large find. 
so their search today begins in a sprawling field adjacent to that area. But the odds are still stacked against them. They're trying to find rocks that traveled millions of miles and have been buried for thousands of years, somewhere under nine square miles of farmland. You have to be prepared to really put in a lot of time if you want to be a meteorite hunter. It's not the kind of thing where you can say, gee, I'm gonna go out and find a meteorite and find one on your first day. It's just not gonna happen. We've gone out in the field sometimes for weeks at a time, 10 hours a day, five days, and we don't find anything. But today, just a few hours into the search, the huge detector picks up a strong signal, which could be the beacon of a meteorite buried deep beneath the surface. Right here, Jeff, I think. There we go. Using the one meter coil, they zero in on their target. Oh, I like the sound of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty good sized target. Really encouraging, really strong. OK, right there. The target is right in the sweet spot of the strewn field, not far from where Steve found the 1,400 pounder. Just down there is, is where you found the monster. Yeah, it's right. almost perfectly aligned, right? Right in the middle of the and big zone. And it sounds zone. deep. I want to dig it by hand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you start digging, I'm calling the backhoe, all right? OK, Dan, we, we did an exact pinpoint. That flag's right on top of it. Dan Woods, a Brenham local, has been helping Steve dig for meteorites for years. Dan is as good as it gets on the backhoe. There's nobody I'd trust more to get a rock out of the hole than Dan. There you go. It's sitting down here where it could be 1,500, 2,000 pounds. Who knows? Who knows? If Steve's prediction is right, they could be sitting on the biggest Brenham find ever. They carefully dig trenches on both sides of the target and use the small detectors to pinpoint its exact location. I'm getting it, but it's stronger on that side, and that side's deeper, so okay. we're probably still further down. OK. Yeah, the deeper the target is, the bigger it has to be in order for our detectors to see it. So the anticipation's building there. Dan, go ahead and a little more. If you bump into something, stop. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, keep going. I don't see anything yet. Getting down to the clay. That's a good sign. There is a certain point below which you're almost guaranteed to have something, because man-made materials, debris, farm implements, cast off bits of junk, tends to be in about the top three feet. So when you start to get down into that dense clay layer, there's not going to be anything human made down there unless it was purposefully buried. And that's pretty unlikely in the middle of a field in Kansas. There's something in there. Oh. Oh. Steve and Jeff, the meteorite men, are closing in on their target, what they believe is a large meteorite buried deep under this wheat field in Brenham, Kansas. There's something in there. Oh. Oh. What is it? That doesn't look very encouraging. No, it doesn't. Let, let's take a little bit off yeah. of here and Dan, let's go slowly right here on the top. Ooh, 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 ooh. It's a little wow. weird. Looks like more of the same. What the hell is that? It looks like a 55 gallon drum. Oh, look, and a barrel inside a barrel. <laughs> How lucky can we get? Two barrels in one hole. It's a double meteorong. 
in the meteorite world, we have well, what are called meteorites, and then what we affectionately call meteorongs. Now, a meteorong could be just a black rock. It can be an old horseshoe or a pair of pliers. Or yeah, it's amazing the different things that are are found out in a field. Look at that. That comes with the territory. You got to find where they're not to make sure you've really covered all the places that they could be. That was a really good signal. And it's sitting in a spot where it, it could have been a monster. And uh, um, it could have been a ton or more. And, uh, and it wasn't. What can we get for that on eBay? Oh, well, all in a day's work. We know another spot where there's not a meteorite. I get sick of saying that. Steve and Jeff redoubled their efforts. They're still convinced that these fields contain undiscovered pieces of the famous Brenham meteorite that broke up as it entered the atmosphere several thousand years ago. But despite the common image of the burning meteorite crashing to Earth, the reality is far different. Contrary to popular belief, meteorites are not burning hot when they hit the Earth. People that have been lucky enough to get there shortly after the fall and touch it or pick it up report that they're either cold or slightly warm to the touch. What we see as a fireball is still miles above the Earth. Most meteorites burn out well before they make impact. Although they may hit our atmosphere at many thousands of miles per hour, most meteorites don't make craters. Atmospheric braking slows them down. A typical meteorite might hit the surface of the Earth at a few hundred miles per hour. Same speed as a golf ball. Two more hours of searching and still nothing. Suddenly, the metal detector is triggered to life. It's another signal, even stronger than the last one. And less than a mile from where they uncovered the barrel. Getting a longer signal this way yeah, than this yeah, way. Yeah. Back hoe. All right. I'm not guessing this time. Yeah, it, it doesn't seem to pay when we guess. You end up with trash. It just embarrasses you. Yeah. By pointing the detector down in the corner, we see that it's still probably deeper. And the signal is a lot louder on this side. So we're probably, we're a little, the target's a little closer to that. You're good. Deeper's always good. The further underground we go, the older the layers are. And so it's time travel. 250 years ago, there wouldn't have been anyone out here that knew how to work iron and steel. So once we get below that, time period, there's nothing human anymore. The only things down there may be extraterrestrial. Oh, wow. Right here. OK, let's jump in the hole with the shovels, dig it out by hand. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting, getting close. close. I don't, I don't, I'm don't getting want to nervous. knock the top off. Oh, 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 oh. What's happened is we've just hit this little pocket and that they, it looks like there's some little crystals in there. So we could have just encountered the outer corroded layer of a meteorite. So we're taking it real easy. There it is. Oh yeah, the magnet's sticking, it's sticking right through the ground. These meteorites contain a great deal of iron, so when we get right on top of the target, we'll, we'll put a very powerful rare earth magnet down in there to see if we can connect with the surface. Reaching into that hole and scraping that dirt off the first time and seeing that little bit sticking up out of the dirt and knowing that it's from outer space, it's just shocking. Every time I still get chills, I go, wow, it really is, it's not a pipe or a horseshoe, or a plow blade. It's the real thing. Oh, wow! Oh. Wow, it's a nice rounded shape. This is looking quite big. <laughs> it looks like 
the, the metal is rusted into the soil. Well, look at that. The outer layer of this, this meteorite's corroded, and pieces are just flaking right off. Looks like the, a, there's a crystal in it. Uh, that crystal indicates that this is a palisite, an extremely rare type of meteorite. A palisite is a stony iron meteorite that's made up of roughly equal parts of iron nickel and olivine, also known as the gemstone peridot. It's pretty substantial. Palisites originated several billion years ago when the core of an asteroid or planet was molten iron and nickel. It's on the outside edge of that core where palisites form their unique mixture of elements. If you cut them thin, uh, they'll become translucent. You can hold them up and, and light will come through. And it's like a cosmic stained glass window. The light shines through and you see these crystals, these gorgeous, glorious, brilliantly colored crystals. Oh my! Yeah. Oh! <laughs> Jeff, look at it. Look at it. It's a monster. This amazing bit of some planet that's billions of years old that burned in our atmosphere and fell in the mud and sat there for thousands of years and nobody knew that it was there. It's too heavy to lift and that's really good news. We find it, we pull it out. It's something you don't forget. It's an amazing moment. Wow. That is a chunk. <laughs> Not only has it uh, been reintroduced to sunlight, but we are the first humans ever to see this visitor from outer space. At 230 pounds, this palisite ranks in the top 1% of all meteorite finds in the world. It's kind of a special moment for us. And proves that Steve and Jeff's hunch was right about there being more meteorites in the Brenham strewn field. They're now convinced that there are even more treasures to uncover here, and they're determined to get to them first. That sounds really big. Encouraged by a monumental 230-pound find, the meteorite men, Steve and Jeff, are back on the hunt, convinced that this field in Brenham, Kansas, may be hiding even larger and more valuable rocks from outer space. Kansas is a meteorite hunter's mecca, with 140 documented meteorite falls, more per square mile than any other place in the U.S. Although scientists don't know why so many meteorites end up in Kansas, they have a pretty good idea of where they started their journey. Most specialists agree that most or all meteorites were once part of the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter in our own solar system. So a large planet or asteroid breaks apart for whatever reason, perhaps it collided with another one, things crash into each other up there in the asteroid belt all the time, apparently. There are billions of pieces of cosmic debris wandering around up there in space. And every now and then, our planet bumps into one of them. The meteorite fall in Brenham has been heavily searched for decades. But Steve and Jeff still believe the area is rich with potential meteorites, if you know where to look. After searching 30 more acres, they encounter another strong target. We get the tractor in. Go, Dan. It's a few minutes ago, this detector got nothing. Now we've got a solid target there, so we're, we're getting closer. Farmer Denny Ross keeps a close eye on the dig. His family owns the land, and Steve approached him for permission to search. He drew up a contract and We'd split the share of one if he sold one and found it so. Oh! Just hit something. Pretty big, I think. That was it, okay. <laughs> Let's get a shovel. Right there. Oh, look how round it is. To their amazement, it looks like another meteorite. Wow. We've just exposed a tiny bit of it and what always makes us really happy is when the magnet sticks. 
Look how deep it is. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the really great moments when you uncover a little bit of it and you go, oh yeah, it really is a meteorite. And then you uncover a bit more and then some mud falls off and you go, oh wow, it's actually that big. We got a big one. One, two, three. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> At 273 pounds, this find is even larger than the first. Two for three. That's not bad odds, actually, in this game. <laughs> Both are in the top 1% of all meteorite discoveries in the world. This is the land of the giants. And it's almost like going on a safari at Jurassic Park. It's just, this is about as good as it can get. Agreed. <laughs> the, uh, the only thing I'm a little concerned about is uh, how we're going to get it out of the field. Yeah, no kidding. The odds of finding two meteorites this large on one expedition is like winning the lottery twice. Each rock could bring in $100,000 or more. The next destination for these rocks will most likely be a private collection, museum, or research facility. In fact, the scientists who study meteorites rely on hunters like Steve and Jeff to provide samples. Uh, we donate a piece of every new specimen that's found to science, and, and they're able to get a lot of information. Uh, they're, they're able to classify the rock as to what type it is. It benefits everybody because they get a sample, a specimen to work with, and we get the benefit of their expertise, of their knowledge. So with more than 500 pounds of meteorites in the back seat, Steve and Jeff take to the highway. Their 1,000 mile journey ends at Arizona State University, home of one of the top meteorite studies programs in the nation. Before entering the research center, they give their space rocks a good cleaning and remove a sample slice to be used for testing. <laughs> Lawrence Garvey, the manager of the school's meteorite collection, takes the sample and preps it to be analyzed. We're just going to do a very rough polish. ASU's I-Beam lab has a particle accelerator. It's one of the few instruments that can quickly determine if Steve and Jeff's find is extraterrestrial or just an ordinary rock from Kansas. Okay, let's start a spectrum right here. It does it by firing a beam of protons into a solid target. Based on the energy released by the collision, scientists can determine the exact composition of the rock atom by atom. They are looking for an abundance of nickel and iron, a mix rarely found in rocks on Earth. In less than 10 seconds, and I can already see the nickel peak, these two peaks right here. The two big peaks right next to it are iron, and not much else to look at. So this, this metallic part is quite pure. The analysis clearly shows that the dominant element is iron, with a significant presence of 8 to 15 percent nickel, overwhelming evidence that this rock is not from our planet. We see that nickel peak to begin to show up. We know we're onto something, because nickel is the tell for us. That's a real classic meteorite spectrum right there. That's what I like to hear, <laughs> classic <laughs> meteorite spectrum. Tests also confirmed that the pieces Steve and Jeff found were part of the historic Brenham meteorite. We analyzed their piece and we compared it with a piece of Brenham that we have in our collection. And they matched up in terms of the content of nickel in these samples. Professor Manakshi Wadwa, who directs the ASU Meteorite Studies program, is an analytical geochemist. I want you to guess which one of these is a meteorite and which one's a meteoron. My work focuses on trying to understand when the planets are forming and how the planets are forming. And you can do that by studying meteorites because they are the oldest record that we have of the very beginnings of our solar system. In fact, ASU has a collection that includes meteorites that were formed even before our solar system. These were probably the very first solids to form four and a half billion years ago. They even contain particles that actually formed around other stars before our sun was even formed. They're basically stardust. In your hand, you're, you're holding the oldest matter that anyone on yes. our planet could possibly touch exactly. with their hand. Exactly, four and a half billion years old and older. As Looks I said. great for its age. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite well. These rocks basically have a story to tell. And as we improve our analytical techniques, there'll, there'll be more things that we can learn from them. Tucked away in a drawer is one of the rarest meteorites in the university's collection, 
a small rock that scientists hope will answer some big questions. The famous Murchison, yeah, does famous it really Murchison. smell? It does, you want to smell it? Wow, it's the smell of outer space. It's actually got a lot of organic materials in it. The Murchison meteorite is classified as a carbonaceous chondrite, a type of stony meteorite containing the organic element carbon. They are the most primitive and unaltered type of meteorite known. It's a little dirty Yeah, it's still got some yeah, of the... Yeah, clean that up, would you? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> still got some of the dirt on it. Scientists believe this ancient rock may hold answers to the mystery of how life on Earth began. Certain types of meteorites, like the carbonaceous chondrite, most likely did bring the organic materials from which life could have gotten started on our own planet. So we're looking at one of our ancestors there, possibly. Well, you know, it <laughs> kind of a cousin. Well, the raw material. We didn't just the, the raw material. material okay. for, right. for, yeah, for life. No wonder we're so into meteorites. We're descended yeah. from them. <laughs> well, maybe you are. <laughs> Just a few days later, Steve and Jeff are back on the road, heading to a new hunting site. The location is a closely guarded secret because they believe there are valuable meteorites here containing something never seen before. Okay, we've got to keep the rest of the way in secret. And that means we turn off the cameras. The meteorite men, Steve Arnold and Jeff Notkin. We're getting a signal. Have found two huge meteorites at Brenham, Kansas. <laughs> like one, two, three. <laughs> Woo! Today, they're heading back out to the field to a site they simply call Alpha. They're keeping the exact location under wraps because they believe there are meteorites here that contain something rare and extremely valuable. Turn off the cameras. Before filming is allowed in the site, the camera crew must sign confidentiality agreements promising not to reveal the location. Welcome to what we call the Alpha site. This is one of our favorite meteorite hunting grounds. Come on, Steve, let's go find some meteorites. Like Brenham, the Alpha site is a location where meteorites have been found in the past. But unlike Brenham, which had been searched heavily, there are very few documented finds at Alpha. In fact, there was no existing strewn field map to give them an idea of how far the fall extended, so they had to make their own. In essence, they are hunting in virgin territory. We're looking at about, what, seven miles now? Yeah, maybe a little more. The exact location where we are today is right on the center line of the strewn field. It's not an actual existing landmark, but it is a theoretical line that Steve plodded through the known area containing all meteorite finds from this fall. But there's never a guarantee. And here at Alpha, it's even more of a shot in the dark because of the limited historical records. Steve, it's really loud. It sounds near the surface. Please scratch around. Make sure, make sure it's something right or something wrong. Okay. post or something. What'd you find? I don't even know. Whoa, Sorry. I've got something over here. I bet it's just a, a piece of old farm equipment. You know, Babe Ruth was the home run king, but he was also the strikeout king. And so you have to be willing to strike out a lot. Well, hey, you add that to the collection, Who I knows? guess. It's kind of cool, actually. Certainly iron. Did you say this was the best bit of the strewn field? Jeff, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Watch that. There's some really big boulders sticking out of the side. They'll make toast out of the detector. I'm sure you've seen them, but just take it easy. Roger that. Not that you're scared of a few boulders or anything like that. We hardly ever seem to have a whole day where something doesn't go wrong. And when the giant metal detector goes down, it brings the search to a halt. You broke it again by driving too fast. Sometimes it'll just be a minor thing. We might break one of the struts or a small piece fall off. That's easy to fix. But when one of the big struts breaks, it can be a real pain in the neck. It's a never ending process. This one's cracked as well. The more it breaks, the more 
a gargantuan assembly it becomes. Grab a couple paper towels. Set that down now. Go back there. OK, hold that there. I think Steve likes to think of me as his butler. Here, okay. hold that. Jeff, can you clean this? Jeff, can you hand me that saw? Jeff, can you hold this pipe? So it's not exactly what you'd call high tech work, but uh, the perks are very good. After losing several hours, Steve and Jeff are back on the hunt. Hey, Jeff, that one sounded strong. I'm going to check it. This smaller unit has a very limited range. And the fact that I'm getting a loud signal means that it's either a very big target or it's something really close to the surface, or possibly both. Let's see what we've got here. The few documented meteorite finds at Alpha were buried closer to the surface, so Steve and Jeff have foregone the backhoe here. Shovels and sweat should be all they need to uncover a target. It's possible that the meteorite fall at Alpha is more recent than the one at Brenham, so there has been less time for soil to build up. Oh, oh! That's something. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to hit it hard. Oh. Wow. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look that at the looks rust. really good. Dude! Finally! Look at that. That's potentially a nice shape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been waiting? This rock has come from so far and has been sitting there so long, I haven't been hunting nearly as long as this guy's been traveling to get to me. Oh, wow. Look at that. The latest visitor from outer space to be discovered in the Earth. At 33 pounds, this meteorite is considerably smaller than the finds at Brenham. But the minute they pulled it out of the ground, Steve and Jeff saw something in the rock that could be far more valuable. This meteorite contains something we've never seen in a meteorite. Here's our newest find, and as he's a bit of a VIP, he gets to ride up front with me. Ah, place of honor. But as they head out to examine the rock, they pick up another strong signal. Whoa. And can't resist checking it out. That was something. Meteorite men, Steve and Jeff, have hit pay dirt with a 33 pound find at their secret alpha site. Oh, wow. Where they believe the meteorites contain a hidden treasure never seen before. Look at that. But as they head out to examine their latest find, they hit another strong signal. Whoa. That was something. You grab two detectors and no shovels. What can I tell you? I'm a gearhead. Finding two of the rare alpha rocks in one day is extremely unlikely, but Steve and Jeff still check out every signal. It's digging time again. Even after all these years, not for one minute does it become humdrum. <laughs> <laughs> it's like digging through tarmac. Man, this is hard you know, this is Steve. So much for shallow targets in yeah. Alpha. <laughs> Let's keep digging. <laughs> I never go, oh, do we have to dig up another meteorite? How tiresome. This could be an extraterrestrial visitor down here. Resting's not allowed. To go anywhere and even find one tiny meteorite ah. is a great achievement. Ooh. Yeah, there's Ooh. definitely something down there. Space is huge. Those fragments of debris from the asteroid belt could have gone anywhere, away from Earth, into the sun, a million billion possibilities. A piece encounters the Earth's atmosphere, it doesn't melt, burn up completely. It falls to Earth, it doesn't fall in the ocean, it doesn't fall in the Arctic or in the rainforests. It actually lands somewhere where we might one day find it. It's definitely sticking to a magnet. Wow. <laughs> it looks like a corner of a meteorite. I don't think it's a meteor wrong. We have 
overcome literally astronomical odds to find one. We might need to dig a fairly large hole to get this guy out. Exhausted but exhilarated, they're now in a flat out race to dig it out before the sun sets. Look, there's a nice little yeah. corner exposed. We might be able to lever it up from yeah. that. Oh, <laughs> it's moving a little bit. <laughs> that was a superhuman oh, effort. I... Look, it's kind of wedge shaped. <laughs> oh! oh! It looks like a spaceship. It is a monster. Look at that. Look at that! What a privilege it is to be the first humans ever to see this amazing thing that traveled millions of miles to see us, to be here. Not only a visitor from outer space, but a very substantial one. <laughs> At 109 pounds, this find is more than three times the size of the first Alpha rock. And upon closer examination, Steve and Jeff are even more excited about the meteorites they've uncovered here. It's just covered in all these little indentations. It's so unusual. But it's what's inside those indentations that sets the alpha meteorites apart. It is packed with olivine crystals. The mineral olivine, named for its olive green color, is commonly found on Earth. In gem form, it's known as peridot, the August birthstone but meteorites containing olivine are extremely rare. And what makes Steve and Jeff's find so amazing is that much of the olivine has made the tumultuous journey to Earth without shattering. For example, the Brenham meteorite. If you look at a slice of Brenham, all the crystals are shattered in it. But the crystals in the Alpha meteorites are remarkably clear and unbroken. Harder and harder to find. For Steve and Jeff, that means that the rocks they've been finding at Alpha may soon be coveted by more than just scientists and collectors. What's exciting is that we're finding quite a few of these crystals are gem quality. And so we are able to facet gemstones out of them. Steve sent one of the faceted stones to gemologist John Koivula, an expert on peridot from meteorites. It's the only extraterrestrial gem we have. A good portion of the asteroid belt consists of rocks, basically, and then a few have the olivine grains. So it's a, it's, it's a rarity to begin with, right in the asteroid belt. And how many of them are going to actually hit the Earth? Not many. So when one does hit, it's a rare occurrence. In the world of gems, rare equals pricey. Peridot found on Earth goes for about $60 a carat, while peridot from meteorites sells for more than $1,000 a carat. This is one of Steve Arnold's stones. Actually, this is very big for an <laughs> extraterrestrial peridot, and it's very nice. So basically, you're wearing a part of creation around your neck when you're wearing this, because this is the interior of a planet. <laughs> That's what it is. It's a piece of an interior of a planet. <laughs> when you think about it, these meteorites are literally packed with gemstones from outer space. What's even more amazing is the discovery made by accident. The Alpha Stones, when cut and polished, display chatoyance, the mysterious light within the stone, similar to light reflecting in a cat's eye. Chatoyance has never been seen in a meteorite before. Steve's and Jeff's discovery opens up a new scientific question of why this effect has only appeared in the Alpha Stones, a question that may help unlock some of the many mysteries carried to Earth by these extraterrestrial visitors. The meteorite men are a new breed of space explorer, seeking out hidden traces of our cosmic past buried deep beneath the surface of our planet and their quest is just beginning. There are big meteorites out there waiting to be found. There are meteorites out there that probably landed yesterday that no one's seen, and there are meteorites out there that landed a thousand years ago that nobody's seen. Come on, Steve, let's go find some meteorites. Let's go. We as humans are fascinated by mysteries, particularly the really big mysteries, like what is our place in the universe? Meteorites tell us something about the very deep past, four and a half billion years ago when our solar system was just forming. It's kind of this unending quest of, of chasing down knowledge. 
But more than that, it's a chance for us to hold in our hand a little bit of the substance of space that has, against all odds, found its way to our planet. Hey, Jeff, sounds like we got something here. <laughs>